What's going on, Flood Nation, and welcome back. Today, we have a very entertaining interview with one of the most interesting crypto personalities I think existing here in the space. Some of you might already know him, some of you might not, but he is damn near prolific over there on crypto Twitter with over 100,000 followers. I'm gonna link his Twitter in the description below. Definitely go check it out. I will caveat here and warn you that a lot of what you're gonna hear is a lot of personality. If you ask him, he will admit that there's a lot of trolling going on. He likes to have fun. So if you're very precious and you can't handle someone trolling or making fun of things, maybe stay away. Also, this episode has a little bit of not safe for work language. So if you're sensitive to profanity, I would encourage you to not watch this episode. My apologies to those sensitive ears out there, but this is more of a casual conversation with someone who's very funny, been in the space for a very long time, and has some phenomenal opinions as to what's going on here in crypto land. So with that said, I hope you guys are excited. If you are, throw a like on this video and get ready for an awesome conversation with BitLord from Crypto Twitter. Welcome to the channel, the one and only BitLord. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? Great. So if you guys don't know BitLord, he is uh, pretty prolific out there on crypto Twitter. He's got one of the biggest crypto Twitters out there, over 100,000 followers. Uh, and yeah, like you have quite a personality on Twitter, man. How did this whole thing start? Oh, look, you know, it's just everyone from the forums back in the early day, like 2012, 2013, looking for something more sort of interactive and more sort of on the go. And a lot of people, they just started migrating to Twitter, you know, uh, and then Twitter became like the, the Bitcoin talk forum, but more sort of interaction and live. So, you know, that's sort of how Twitter started. And I just got on board. I thought, you know what, I, I enjoy it. Like just, you know, just tweeting, tweeting, tweeting. And uh, I just enjoy myself. I don't even know how the fuck I've got 100,000 followers, man. I really don't, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's your tweets are, are entertaining, to say the least. Uh, and maybe what I'll do when I edit this is I'll put a few of them up there so that people can see them. Maybe your, your, your price predictions, I think, for alt season, maybe I'll put that one up there. How did, yeah, you, uh, yeah. how did you come to make these uh, price predictions for alt season? Uh, I'm not sure, man. I think... Um, depending on what time was, I mean, I could have been on drugs or I could have just been like, you know, like what I wanted or something like that. And we, I don't know. I can't remember. I, I pinned it and I, I like it sitting there because it makes me dream. I'm like, you know, $65,000 BTC, like 3,200, all that sort of shit. And end of the day, look, I've seen some real stuff in crypto and I know that some of those targets are achievable. I had a $2 USDT target. People thought I was insane. It hit $9. It hit $990 on Kraken. Mic drop, bam, it happens. So you cannot rule these things out. Can BTC be 65K? I, I, I think so. I think the 65K Bitcoin is is well within reason. Uh, I'm just going to read off these predictions just so that the audience has, has a bit of a, a scope of what's been listed here. $65,000 Bitcoin, $3,200 Ethereum. I think those are responsible, responsible predictions. Exactly. $1,200 $1, Litecoin, we, we shall see. $1,100 Monero. Uh, $220 XRP. Uh, you're going to have to explain that one. Uh, Look, stop, I just stop on that one. Actually, um, I revised my target from 220 to $28. Um, okay. And I was just shy of it uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, if you click on the thread, you'll see it. Uh, XRP hit $24 on one exchange. Wasn't too far off. So, Okay, but hold on. Let's 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 rewind here. What exchanges? Because what we want to get to talk about here is you have a big personality and you do a lot of trolling, right? This isn't all. You're not you're not out here saying I want to be your financial advisor here. You're out there just having fun, and you know uh, you're saying that USDT hit nine hundred and ninety nine dollars, yeah. but that's not that was not a tradable wick, right? That's not like a stable price, right? How, when you say that, well, how did it hit $999? On what exchange, over what time period, what happened? Like, what, what well, do you mean? Well, look, the thing is, was it a tradable price? Was it real? Yes, orders that were cascaded all the way up to $990, they filled. There was no trade rollbacks, there was no bullshit. It was real, it happened, and it happened on one of the biggest, most legit exchanges, which was Kraken. Mm -hmm. We all know, we all see it, you can see screenshots in the thread, it was legit. Now, the thing is, uh, did it happen? All exchanges was, you know, USDT trading at 990s. No, but I'll take the clout. And it's like, it, <laughs> the thing is that tweet, it's about like, forget what you think, you know, anything's possible. And I always knew that a USDT would pump, you know, past $2 because you see the dumbest shit in crypto. So, you know, a lot of guys are like, ha ha, what a loser. And I'm like, bro, I know for a fact it's going to smash $2 because we're going to see some dumb shit like that. And we did. So it, it just goes to show, look, 
you know, I'm having some fun. I'm having a laugh. But look, there's merit to some of these things. And, and, and you know, you, you can't take away from that. It, it hit. So, so let's, let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back to your early days in crypto. How did you get into this whole crypto situation? When did you start making content? Like, I know you say you've been in this since 2011, maybe even earlier. I'm not sure. Like, how did you find it, right? It was such, such a niche thing back then. Well, officially 2012, but I mean, back then, you know, it, it, you had to be in a very specific group. So you could hear about it through uh, cyberpunk mailing lists, uh, cyber, cyberpunk mailing lists, whatever the hell. Uh, you'd have to be like a super, super cryptography nerd to hear about something like that in a, in a cryptography forum or something. Um, or traditionally, I mean, as most people would have seen that you can uh, buy and sell drugs on the Silk Road. That's how a lot of people heard about it. It's like, mm. wow, you know, you'd hear about these crazy stories you have a look at it, oh, wow, it's actually real. Then you look at a closer look at Bitcoin and you're like, okay, now there is actually some substance behind this. Mm-hmm. And many times I'd asked uh, you know, advice, I'd even went to my accountant and said, look, what do you think of this? Is, is, is it, re- it sounds like a really good idea. And I used to like collecting coins and um, rocks and crystals and things like that. And he said, look, it's a scam, you know, stay away from it. And uh, you know, it was only a couple bucks and then you know, quadrupled, quadrupled. And I'm like, hey dude, like, come on, what is this? And then he's telling me, he said, look, that's what they try to do to rope you in. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And then it kept going up. I'm like, fuck this guy. He knows nothing. He's just some noob. So I just went, bam, all in. Uh, that was, uh, I left oil and gas. I resigned oil and gas and just went for deep in crypto, mate. Didn't look back. And it's been eight years of just, you know, one crazy ride. So, so what were you doing in the oil and gas sector? Uh, I did a trade as a Boilermaker coded welder and then I started studying uh, and I became a lead auditor in environmental management systems. So cool. uh, that's, a, that's a bit of my background. I was so doing so you, had an, you had an analytical background there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, uh, I was starting to move into the corporate world a bit and I just found, look, everybody wants to just, it's, it's all like that, you know? And it got to a point where I just, I wasn't enjoying, I was looking for something else. And it was around about the same time that the crypto opportunity came up and I'm like, wow, this is the future. This has got to be it. So, so you started trading, you started, uh, were you trading at that time? Were you holding, like, were you just dollar cost averaging? Were you just buying, buying, buying? Like, how did you get your start and how did you sustain yourself? Because I think what a lot of people misunderstand in crypto is you can't just buy a couple coins and then your life sorted. Like you have to have some vocation within the industry for, for, for you to have staying power. Yeah, I mean, well, beforehand, I was trading stocks. I was trading Forex. Uh, when I was okay. younger, I had a good run on stocks, uh, which was the worst thing because it gave me all this confidence. And then I went ahead and tried to apply that to Forex. I'm like, okay, well, I can do really well. Um, worst thing to happen when you start trading is win, 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 because then you don't know how to manage your losses. That happened to me. I came into Forex. Um, lucky I was, uh, I was in oil and gas. I was earning really good money. I just continued loading my brokering account. I mean, I get like mm-hmm. an email saying, you know, margin alert. I'm like, oh, fuck it. I just sent like, you know, 10 grand across and <laughs> bam, like, you know, to sustain the margin. Dumbest thing you can ever do. Uh, and I got my ass handed to me in Forex. And I learned a lot from that. But in reality, look, I got into crypto at a really good time where you could just throw money at anything and everything would go up. I mean, I'm serious. You could just put money in whatever the fuck wake up, doubled, tripled, and it would just go on and on and on. So it was a really, really good time. And my whole thing was always looking for the next best thing, looking for something that's unique, something that hasn't moved, something that um, it, it doesn't even need to make sense. It just needs to be attractive to the crowd. Uh, and as we know, a lot of this stuff is rubbish, but it doesn't matter what we think of it. It's what everybody thinks of it. And you know that, that time, was like a, it was a really good period. So um, a lot of my strategy was um, more sort of like um, – uh, sort of started as investing, holding these things, letting them appreciate, you know, going through that market cycle and just forgetting what you think, you know, in terms of, okay, I've, I've, I've made two, 300% thinking, oh, it's good money, I should cash out and just understanding how much money it's flowing in, holding, putting like a, a, a time lapse, a, a time period on, on these holds. And then, you know, sort of cashing on the way up like that. That was, that was a strategy. Does that work today? No, it does not work today. Yeah. When do you think, so, I mean, obviously in 2017, I think that that was kind of like the big uh, explosion where we had just too many people creating too many uh, uh, coins hopping on the trend and and there was not enough substance there. And, you know, uh, I think that's maybe was was that the end of the era, era where you could really just kind of ride the general market where you could really just kind of be a little ignorant towards uh, the actual underpinnings of the projects. Is, is that gone, done history? No, look, I mean, 
back then, even it just came down to every look, having so much money forced into an industry, having so much money, I mean, it's all looking for the next best thing. And mm -hmm. it's that huge herd mentality of, you know, what is the next Bitcoin? What is the next opportunity? That's how you got, you know, silly things like, um, uh, you know, Dogecoin, um, Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, you know, Ethereum was based on, it was Bitcoin 2.0. So that's what sent that thing to, you know, uh, you know, 1200, um, was it 12, uh, 0.12, 0.14 BTC, something like that. It just, I mean, it started from nothing and it's just all this new money looking for that next big thing. And back then it was such a, such a small industry. I mean, Bitcoin grew out of nothing. Then you've got everybody cashed up on Bitcoins, just throwing money at stuff. And now the industry is so big and wide and there's so much competition. It's like, you know, if one project pops up, there's like, you know, 10 more that sort of do the same thing. It's like a lot of clones, a lot of competition and, um, the money is sort of, it's not concentrated anymore. It's very spread out. So mm -hmm. we don't see uh, those style of pumps anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit of time until I think we'll see them again. Because if you have a look at the whole entire industry right now, things are a little bit, people are confused. There's no clear direction. Are we going up or are we going down? And until we find uh, that stability in that direction, um, we're not going to see anything extremely silly uh, just yet. So what is what is what are we waiting for? You know, in your mind, right? What what do you think is the thing that is going? Is it just time? Does time need to pass? Does does maturity need to just take its its slow time to to build? Are we really just still emptying out from this insane speculative wave? Like, is this just what happens when a market over overdoes itself, like it did in twenty seventeen? We just have no choice but to wait it out, or is there actually some? technological innovation is there some regulatory change is there some kind of actual functional change that when it's flipped we can see you know a new flood look i think it's good to do i mean right now there's there's a lot of money uh, that wants to get into bitcoin not just bitcoin but also a lot of the the business and supporting infrastructure around the whole ecosystem there's a lot of money in crypto it doesn't matter how you look at it so mm -hmm. um all of this money i mean they don't want to pay eight, $9,000 a coin. They don't want to pay $7,000 a coin. It suits them. It's in everybody's, not everybody. It's in, you know, some people's best interest if the price comes down. Um, imagine being able to load up a, you know, a three, $4,000 BTC as an institutional buyer and um, knowing that you've got a block halving uh, and then another one after that, that's a good opportunity to, to you know, to, to load up for the next sort of 10 year period. I mean, um, if Bitcoin is, uh, is it continues its success, um, you know, continues, uh, um, increasing adoption, then look, 10 years from now, today's prices don't really mean a hell of a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I feel like there's a lot of focus on things like um, back, as, as you mentioned, things like that. Does it have a negative effect on the price? Well, not really. It's it's really like a, if you look at the volume in, in regards to back, there's not a lot of volume. There's not a lot happening there. These people are already trading Bitcoin through um, you know, offshore companies, subsidiaries and things like that on the exchanges available today. Back is just a legitimate way for them to, to enter through and they're going to take their time. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of wisdom there. And, you know, just like you were saying, 10 years time, I mean, 10 years in, in the past, we didn't even have prices. There wasn't a price on Bitcoin or any crypto. So, you know, to go from that to where we are now, pretty astounding. And and yeah, like 10 years in the future, we fail to see as retail investors the, the scope of time that the banks are thinking on the scope of time that the big investors think on, right? They don't think on next year, next quarter. They think on 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And when it comes yeah. to money, like a revolution in money has not happened in centuries, right? We haven't had a, a change of the way that we're exchanging currency in centuries. So for us to want this kind of explosive virality, really the money kind of change I think it's going to go a lot slower. At first, I thought it was the internet, right? Oh, we have the internet. It's going to be like Facebook. One, one day, it's just one friend telling you, and then the, the next month, it's everyone in the world's on it. But I don't think it's going to be the same with money. I think money moves a lot slower than that. Yeah, I, I do agree. And the thing is, look, there's, there's two ways to look at it. I, I can see that we can, we can break down here. Um, you know, we can visit some of, the, uh, some of that lower region, um, and that is just the ultimate accumulation period for a lot of big money and um that would be that look that 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 would be ideal because it would it would strengthen the industry a lot of the um a lot right now in the industry there's a lot of uh, projects there's a lot of people things and stuff like that that 
realistically, uh, they would not survive um, uh, in a bear market or in a, in that sort of price. So it, it just sort of strengthens uh, the industry. Um, we've had a lot of bad actors, a lot of crap, and uh, basically puts us in a better position for the future. On the other end, look, if we pump from here, if we go up and uh, nip the upper end of the bolly, 12,000 12, and keep on moving, I won't complain. Um, so look, it's you're going to start looking at it like the long term, you know? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and definitely time preference is uh, having a low time preference is the way to be. Um, but yeah, I'm curious, you know, like as we as we move forward, it, it feels like all the singular events that we've been looking forward to have not really panned out, right? The the backed, you know, ETFs, you know, obviously we didn't get an ETF, but we have sort of, you know, stock market assets like Grayscale. You know, if if these big institutions really, really wanted a bite of Bitcoin, they could, right? They could do it yeah. already. So the sort of... Uh, narrative that we're waiting on some big revolution in the government to, to just come it's i feel like it's kind of hollow that narrative right it is i mean you got to understand like if um you're a big big company or a big investor you're not waiting for backed or cme or grayscale to come and do the work for you you've got an offshore company you've got a subsidiary the money is then going to uh you know big tracks finance um bit stamp wherever and then it's going back into your wallet. You don't need to, you don't need these things. I mean, look, yeah. have a look at crypto. Everything is done offshore um, in these um, in these countries outside of jurisdiction because that's the way you do business. These big companies do the same thing. They're not waiting for CME. CME and uh, back and things like that, it just sort of, um, when the market is a, a lot more, um, a lot more accessible, then perhaps some of these companies will be doing more stuff on there. But as you, as you know, look, uh, one of the requirements to get this ETF is having trusted, regulated um, exchanges to be able to use for price points. See me and back to two of those exchanges. It's going to take a long time to develop that liquidity and that infrastructure. Once we get that in place, there is no doubt that we will have an ETF. There is no doubt. It might take a, another couple of years to develop that system, but uh, we're, we're getting there. Yeah, it's pretty hard to say because, you know, the CEO of BACT has just been appointed to the U.S. Senate. And so it's kind of hard to say that a sitting U.S. senator that was appointed, right, by the governor um, that is running an exchange owned by the New York Stock Exchange, a yeah. parent company, it's kind of hard to throw the label of illegitimate on that. It becomes, it becomes increasingly hard. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, now, I, what I love about your content that you create is you're relentlessly positive about this industry. And it's so easy to turn negative. But I feel like most of the tweets I see out of you are just so, so positive. Like, uh, you know, are you in on the whole, like, do you ever get bearish? Do you ever get, you know, uh, are, are there ever news days that make you feel bad about crypto? Because it seems like you have just such an optimistic view on this whole industry. Yeah, look, I mean, I think about it in in terms of like, you know, decades sort of thing, where we're going to be in 10 years, 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 years, you know, sort of sort of past that. So uh, I just got over sort of short price. I mean, it doesn't mean too much. I mean, sometimes I tweet about it like, oh, my God, fuck this. But it's just like, in a way, it's like a, it's just a feeling at the time. It's just a, a sort of sentiment. Do I really give a shit uh, if, if we go down? No, uh, re really no. It, it's sort of it's sort of a good thing, you know. Uh, and far too much, I spent time uh, fussing over that and and being like, you know, it, it's all over or whatever. We've we've been through that a thousand times, up and down and up and down. It's all the same thing now. To me, it's just like this over the next ten or twenty years. And look, I could be wrong. We all could be wrong, but. I guess that's a risk we take, you know. If it, if it does break down and go to zero, then shit, man. So on on that note, I think that there's been a big wave of there's been a big wave of blame being shifted to influencers and content creators. I actually haven't participated in this because it's just it's not. I've, I've been focused on other things, but there's a lot of people who have been promoting leverage trading, and they have referral links, and so people are saying that it's irresponsible for these content creators to be promoting these exchanges when their audience is just going to get wrecked and they're getting paid off of it. Do you feel that it's irresponsible, or you know, where does the responsibility sit if someone gets wrecked? Look, this is the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I mean, taking that approach, it's like, you shouldn't be talking about crypto. You shouldn't be shilling crypto to your audience. That's the sort of mindset. But uh, I had heard a little bit about this. And 
um, I actually looked at a few of the guys that are taking this stance and trying to, you know, pressure these people. What it comes down to is the fact that they're jealous that they, they're not doing that. They're not making money like that. They didn't think of it. Um, it's actually quite an entrepreneurial thing. Um, secondly, a lot of these guys actually shield literal scams, ICO scams, BitConnect and things like that. So I'm confused how any of them had the audacity, stupidity or the balls to tell guys that are producing good content, showing people how to margin trade, showing people things about the crypto world that they want to know. How can you hate on that? It makes no sense. And in actual fact, when leverage is used correctly, it's actually leverage is actually there to reduce your risk. A lot of noobs use it to increase risk. Hey, I'm driving a car. Um, I might crash the fucking thing. You know, like that's my fault. You know, that that that's how it is. There's enough content. There's enough stuff out there. You know, you cannot, um, you can't tell somebody. Uh, you can show people, look, you can drink the water, but fuck, I mean, if they're if they're gonna go ahead and eat the bottle and stuff like that. It's not you, you know what I mean? There's enough information out there. So it's a silly, it's a silly, silly thing. Do you this. think, do you think that, and I agree with a lot of what you said, you know, I think I, I always understood leverage trading as something to avoid, right? I, I, that was just the narrative that I understood, right? Leverage trading is not for the casual trader, right? You have to understand the mechanisms, right? And I've seen people make an amazing amount of profits. Uh, Eric Crown, one of my buddies who comes on this show, one of the most gifted traders, but he'll be the first one to tell you, like, my content is geared at people who want to be professional traders, people who want to do this for a living. And yeah. so, you know, like, at what, at what threshold do, do you have to want to be a professional trader to use leverage? Is, is that the belief? No, the thing is, look, you have to start somewhere. Yeah, if, if you're going to get into and look, I, and I encourage everybody to, to try um, leverage trading or derivatives trading. Um, but it all comes down to managing your risk. And look, nobody is, not everybody's going to be a professional trader. Not everybody's going to make money. But the thing is, if you have the dedication, if you have the spirit and the will to put in the time, you can do it. There's absolutely nothing stopping you. I mean, if, if somebody can do it, so can you. So it all comes down to dedication and discipline. So uh, one of the first things I'd say is say, look, um, you know, start with a small amount, get it into an exchange, learn, understand, pay attention and manage your risk. In reality, you shouldn't be risking. Um, and this is, uh, this is a traditional sort of saying it's, you shouldn't be risking more than 1% per trade. Uh, and with that, um, you know, you get enough trade data, you get your strike rate, uh, you get your R and R, you can go ahead and, and tweak it to make it profitable. But if you're only risking 1% per trade, um, and, uh, you know, you've got like a, a, a a three to one R and I, I mean, you just need to win like one of those three trades to stay in the game. Um, so look, there's a million different ways to do it. So just more content. Yeah, I, I agree completely. So what you, what you do, I think really well is you stay as much as you've been in this game forever. You really do stay, uh, on, on the side of always looking at the new projects. And I feel like as someone who I, I come from a product background, so I was like so obsessed with all these new altcoins. And then after, you know, seeing how it all panned out throughout 2018, I sort of started to kind of, I guess, grow a little numb to the, to the new pitch deck, to the new white paper, to the new team slides. I, I started to really just feel like uh, it was all, it was all, you know, how many of these have I seen fail sort of thing? And how do you, how do you stay hungry to find those next new altcoins? And what do you look for? So right now I'm not really looking for any new altcoins. A lot of my focus has been uh, shifted uh, and this started sort of last year was to uh, products and services. So business, things like that. That's where I feel like uh, a lot needs to be done. Look, there's a lot of money in that. And when the market turns, yeah, the, there'll be a lot more focus on these altcoins. Right now, look, I still have a lot of love for altcoins. I still hold altcoins. Um, I'd, still, uh, I'd still like to be buying them, but um, I'm, I'm, done, I'm done buying right. There's, there's, uh, there's no real anything I need to buy right now. I have enough. My bags are packed. I can sit on that. I can relax. Uh, and look, they may keep going down. I can weather the drawdown. Uh, we've all weathered um, big drawdowns. Have a look at Matic, for example. Guys, uh, you know, took a, a massive loss on that and then bam, it just went absolutely to the moon uh, through that whole chop period. You can't exactly trade that. But uh, if you do your research, you know it's a good project. You can kick back and have faith in that. Let it do its thing. Let it play out. Okay, but on the, on the Matic topic, 
what are you describing as the as the boom? Because it did go boom, but I, I also saw it went bust recently and possibly the least organic uh, fall. I, I don't know if I've ever seen a, a less organic looking fall than this. I, let, let's just talk about that for a second. I've never seen a bigger fall off than that. It was something like 50, 60% in, in what, like minutes? Like what, how... The kind of stuff that will make sh no one ever want to come to crypto, right? You see, you see months of a rising trend, and then you see minutes of a falling, you know, dagger that removes yep. all profit from the situation. Like, how? What happened in your mind? How does it? How does it reflect on where we're at as a community? Look, that really reflects badly on Binance. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It it, look, it, ref it reflects very badly on Binance, uh, CZ. Uh, and the Matic team, the people involved, because look, that's not some whale just cashing out. We saw transactions um, that had sent 15% uh, and it was corrected to 3% of the Matic supply, millions and millions and millions of dollars, um, you know, to the exchanges. And look, it had, a, it had a nice pump. We saw CZ promoting it across um, across Twitter, across other avenues. So this, the CEO of an exchange is actually promoting this coin. Then I'll see all these news agencies like um, CoinDesk, Cointelegraph, literally saying, uh, you know, it's going to the moon and stuff like that. I've tweeted uh, this stuff and I, I can't believe they were posting this shit. And then somebody, an insider, likely from the team, um, even Binance are known to hold IEO projects as well. Somebody has cashed out and dumped and continued selling and then what's happened, that's caused a cascade. It, uh, other people could have found out that, you know, this person is selling and then that person decided to sell and it just caused this massive cascade and where pe people literally just started panic, uh, panicking. And look, you've got to understand the team, if they're holding these coins, the, the pre-mine, it's literally printed out of thin air. So they can dump it for, they can dump it to zero if they wanted to. They have enough of their coins. There is no way any sound, let, let's say I bought, I bought this shit, um, you know, a week or two ago. There's no way I'm just going to go and, and just sell, 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 sell all the way down for, you know, the next hour. No way. That's harming my investment. So it's somebody uh, that has pre-mine. That's, that's the only way I look at it. And So either, either Binance or the team? Yeah, look, I mean, this is really hard to say. I mean, as, as if Binance would do something like that, um, you know, as the company, could there be somebody acting on their behalf or somebody doing something they shouldn't be potentially did somebody get some some coins unlocked on an account and just thought fuck it probably there's there's absolutely no other explanation it's not like the whole market just goes holy shit get out matic's bad because matic was actually doing really well everybody was excited for it you know so it's some individual or group of individuals have done this cz went ahead and pointed out look there's it doesn't look like there's any wrongdoing on the exchange of course he's going to say that. He's not going to say, actually, these guys did this and that and there was a bit of a, a dump. Fuck no. He's, he's going to make the exchange look good. Um, yeah. But let's be honest. We know there was some shady shit going on. It doesn't matter what anyone says. You can't convince me otherwise. Yeah, I mean, there's there's simply, you know, Matic had probably the most, uh, Matic and Chainlink, are one of the, there's, it's one of the top performers of this year. And it's also the best performing Binance IEO uh, probably. And so it has all this backing, but then of course it came with these exposed sort of facts where it's like, yo, the team controls so much. The team's been dumping. Like it's, it's kind of sad, you know, and, and you look at it and, and there's so many people who I think got roped into the hype, especially as it started to climb back up and, and reach a new high. I don't know if it completely reached a new high. I think it did. Um, mm. and, and yeah, like it just feels like, uh, examples like Maddox show, I think, how far we are away um, from uh, who's going to, who from Wall Street is going to come and look at that chart and go, oh, I want to be involved with this, you know, like. Well, I guess what it comes down to, I mean, you know, guys from Wall Street, they'll look at the, the metrics on that token and then they never touch it. They know how much the team has. They know that you know, they can just unload that at any time. So those guys wouldn't touch it. But the thing is, like, you know, a lot of, a lot of smaller guys that are getting into the space, they're seeing these news agencies like Coindesk, Cointelegraph, go ahead and, and, and put out these huge pump articles on this token. Um, you're seeing CZ going ahead and promoting this thing. And then the team have literally fucking millions and millions and millions of dollars ready to just dump at any given moment. And there's no, there's no clear um, uh, transparency of when they can and can't. So they can literally just go, yeah, fuck it, you know? And if the project doesn't need to succeed, they can just 
dump it, cash out, and they can go on the merry way. They don't owe anybody shit. So that's that's a problem here. That's a big problem. And in a way, Binance sort of promote and endorse these things. I mean, look at Tron, for example. Binance owned 51% of Tron um, staking nodes. That's insane. Well, they they technically own one, but they could own uh, they could own the the majority of them. They've just voted all into one node. So technically, they're just yeah. one, but they could split it up. You know, they could yeah, split yeah. it up and dominate the market. That's there is such risk there, and we've sort of uh, you know we we put so much trust into these big entities. You know, um, but I guess for me, it's it's just a, a question of something like Matic, right? How much do tokenomics, how much does the actual structure of the token uh, itself matter, right? Because I feel like a scaling solution, right, for Ethereum, the, the token should kind of be like water. It should just flow. It shouldn't be this overpriced um, wealth asset. It doesn't make sense, right? Like, it's a, it's a pipe, right? It's just a pipe between uh, Ethereum and some other thing that you want to use. Why would we... Yeah. Why would we create like a golden tunnel? Like we don't need that. We just need a pipe to go between Ethereum and this dApp that you want or Ethereum and this other thing that you want. And so why would, it, why would something like Matic even grow in value? There, that's something I'm not even sure of. Yeah, look, I, I didn't spend a lot of time researching Matic. Uh, I've sort of traded it here and there. But the thing is, look, it's, it's just one of those things that, it just catches on, you know, it, it becomes like the, the latest thing. And as I said before, a lot of this shit doesn't make sense. And yeah. it's just that herd mentality where it's like Matic, Matic, Matic. And then obviously it doesn't help when you've got, um, you know, these, these huge media organizations basically saying to buy this stuff after it's up 300% for uh, the month, things like that. I mean, it just sort of fuels it, you know, and so how do you shows. how do you play that? How do you play that? Because I know you see these games and you're not necessarily like for me, I see those games and I just stay away, right? Whereas I see you actively engaging, trying to game it yourself and see where the herd's going, see where the hype is. I feel like you stay engaged, whereas I sort of start to back away when I start to see that the games are getting so outlandish that they can't be predicted in my opinion that the predict like any fundamental analysis, any math based analysis, you can't get to where these numbers are, right? So all of a sudden it's like, how do you game it? How do you even play in that world? A big part of it is, you know, you, you gotta have the basics in place. I try to keep it as simple as possible, but uh, another big part is, is, is sort of sentiment. I mean, have a look at, um, Tezos is a good example. Tezos has, uh, you know, has Coinbase on board, the Coinbase staking. So, you know, big money can park up in Coinbase and uh, go ahead and bake this stuff. Uh, it's gonna be offered to, um, a lot of people, a lot of people on Coinbase, it's very easy to get money through. Uh, it has support across many exchanges. And you see sentiments start to pick up on Twitter. Everyone's talking about, you know, Tezos, Tezos, Tezos. And then, you know, it has a nice little dip and it's like, well, we could buy some and maybe sell it for a little bit more. I just, you know, just like looking at the charts and all of the, the sentiment and also what's happening in regards to the supported infrastructure exchange and the shit, that simple. Fuck it, you know, buy this shit, probably sell it for more. That's as far as it goes, mate. So, so you know, and I, and I feel like that's that's part of what makes me a little bit, uh, you know, that's part of why I stopped being so enthusiastic about altcoins is I was convinced at a time that strong teams, strong products, strong utility use case, actually usage in the real world. I think a good example of this would be a VeChain, right? VeChain's making multi-billion dollar partnerships, right? They're making crazy partnerships just like they always have been. And, and I know that some people believe that VeChain's led people on, and I'm sure they have to a certain degree, um, but they are still continually making amazing news. Yet their token just won't move, right? Their token just yeah. won't, won't perform. And so it's a question of, do, do the fundamentals actually matter or is it purely just a hype game? Is it purely, a, a, should you just forget about the white papers and just follow Twitter? You know, is that, is that essentially... No, 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 no. I mean, you got to understand. Okay, look at VeChain, for example. Now, tell me, in regards to the token, look, they sold the token, ICO, whatever the case, raised a lot of money to get the project going. Now, what role does that token play in these partnerships? Do we need that token for these partnerships? Uh, let's say they're going to partner with Alibaba or, um, uh, you know, Coca-Cola Amatil, um, you know, to verify the authenticity of products in China. Do we need the token for that no we don't we don't that that that, that product that system um it you know you could call it blockchain or you could just call it a database or a system do we need the token 
nope. Uh, so I guess that's what it comes down to. And look, they still hold a lot of the token. They can continue selling that to fund the project, to fund development. They obviously have a big team, a lot of costs to you know sustain these people. They have to sell. And uh, if depending on if they were holding BTC, like a lot of other people, maybe um, you know they need to keep selling the token. I don't know their. Uh, uh, do we have any transparency on what they're holding in the bank accounts? What BTC they're holding? What tokens they're holding? Where's this transparency? I mean, there's a big difference between the company B chain and the token, and people yeah. are starting to figure this out. And again, it goes back to the 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 sort of uh, usefulness of their technology. If you're talking to Walmart, right? Walmart is working at such scale. Uh, Coca Cola working at such scale that saving one two percent is billions of dollars, right? So, do you, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear. You. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, in the end, they cannot offer some exorbitant price on their service. They cannot be cashing yeah. out on their clients. They have to be competitive because otherwise, what's Walmart and Coca Cola going to do? They're going to, okay, new guy, let's just recreate what you've built. You've open sourced your exactly. code. Let's just rebuild this shit. We'll, we'll get someone on it and, and, and we'll have something similar and we won't have to cut you in at all. So, it almost exactly. seems as if they're forced into a very, very low profit uh, situation where, where it's, it's not going to be uh, them taking advantage, right? They're not going to get to claim like they're the only kid on the block that can do this, this verification. Exactly. Well, yeah. you said it yourself perfectly. I mean, they've, what they've done, and this is the truth of the industry, a lot of these big ICOs raised huge money for research projects. That's what they are, research projects. End of the day, they've spent, we have spent billions of dollars in this industry creating new open source technology that the private sector can take just like that. They have yep. the money, they have the means, they can take this shit. So, um, you know, these big companies, they're just, they kick back and they're, they're enjoying themselves because they now have access to, um, you know, multi-billion dollars worth of technology. Research. And Yeah, and they didn't do shit. So yep. it's, a, it's a good time to be alive. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a lot of opportunities. And, and just like you said, like, there's going to be a lot of services and businesses that start growing. And I'm a big believer in that, right? Don't, oh, yeah. don't build a token for a token's sake, build a build a real business, build a real project that serves the end customer. And then, you know, try to flex and, and use the uniqueness of crypto and blockchain. Um, and again, it's like, once you have so many speculative instruments you've got what you need right you've got what you need if speculation and and volatility is what you need for your product already been satisfied so like having another speculative instrument it's like do is is that adding you know um but i'm a big believer in blockchain gaming i'm a big believer in video games because it becomes yeah. it's a world where we serve you a whole new set of rules you get served with a whole new uh here's the way the world works and yeah. if you like the game then you're getting value. And if you like the game, then you'll get whatever the game tells you to get, whether it's this token or that token or that asset. And so it's it's the goes back to the question of where's the utility, where's the actual value. Um, and I haven't been able to see a sector that I that I think that fits as well as with with gaming. Um, let's shift a little more positively. What are the things that you actually what are the things that actually get you get you more excited here? I know that you're a big XRP fan. I know that you've been very vocal about XRP. Uh, I know that the, there's there's a few projects that you have tattooed on you. Um, t talk to me about your tattooed projects and, and how you feel towards them. Are those your darlings? Yeah, these are my babies. I mean, uh, I love these ones. They're like, uh, obviously, very special I've done some done some amazing things. I mean, uh, I got them in Vegas. Um, at the, at, I mean, at the absolute top of the market, you know, that was the <laughs> absolute brilliant timing. And uh, I sort of stepped back from a few of them around about that time. And yeah, then it was, hasn't been that long now since I've been sort of more sort of involved in XRP again, uh, bought some around 33 cents again. And, and uh, I've just sort of, sort of been like, you know, monitoring and, and watching the space. And Obviously, I get very passionate about what's going on with XRP and I like to go out and, and, and say what I think and what's going on and it sort of catches on. I mean, I'm just sort of speaking what I think, but a lot of people relate with that, you know? So what do you think are the, what do you think are the most positive things about crypto, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, the whole industry right now? What, what gets you the most excited? Look, there's going to be some really cool stuff coming. Uh, look, uh, this is the very start of a, a it's, it's, it's going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. That's how I see it. Um, if you look at 
our forex caught on in the early days. Uh, a lot of people were going and, and trading forex. You look at poker. Poker became massive, and it was it was pretty much shut down by the US. It's still operating to a degree today, but nothing like the success it was. Then forex became huge. Forex was massive. Crypto is the next big thing, and uh, derivative trading. Um, Bitcoin is going to be huge. It's just like, what do I need to start an account? I just need some BTC, bam. I can create an account in like 10, 20 seconds and I'm trading. So uh, to me, I'm, I'm looking at the, the future infrastructure of, uh, of trade, you know, opening up borders, opening up accessibility to literally anyone, anywhere. I, don't, I shouldn't need to go in and sign up with, uh, you know, all this KYC rubbish, go through, give every single document, bank statements, passports, fucking write my name next to a photo to get on an exchange. I should just be able to get in, sign up and go. So uh, I'm very excited about seeing a lot of the world's traders move into the crypto space. And the thing is, um, I'm not even focusing on uh, right, you know, I'm not thinking right now about all the normies that are getting to Bitcoin. I'm, you know, also thinking, or sort of more thinking about traders. I mean, we need spot to be able to trade this stuff. You need to hold spot um, and then, you know, go ahead and trade your derivatives. So huge opportunity, huge opportunity right now. And I think this is a very start of uh, something very, very big. I, I think you're absolutely right, but it does get me wondering, you know, like if everyone's just trading derivatives, then they can make money if the price goes anyway, right? And so there, it takes it takes away some of that early bull run day era, like uh, sort of fundamentals, which is that, hey, if you want exposure, you need to buy spot. And and now it's like you could have nothing to do with the the underlying asset and be making more than anyone else in the industry. So it is kind of... It, it is very interesting, but if you look at traditional markets, the derivatives markets are always orders of magnitude bigger than the spot markets. So, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. All the ICO energy, all the altcoin energy has now shifted to leverage and derivatives. And, yeah. and it seems like it's only going to get bigger, better, stronger at that part of the, the equation. Exactly. And the thing is, that there's going to be a lot of education. There's going to be a lot of things happening in the, in the exchange world to you know, to sort of make it easier for traders to protect, uh, it'll, it all comes down to protecting the traders. It all comes down to risk management. There's some really cool things coming out. Um, I'm excited for uh, December in 2020. And, and look, you think of it, look at it like this, have a look at uh, the gold market, how that matured since, um, you know, like the, the very first, fuck, what is it? The 1800s or, or some shit like that. I kind of remember it's the it's gold very, rush. Very, yeah. Yeah. Very, very 1850s. Old. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. 1800s. Right. So, you're seeing uh, that how the market develops, it's very sort of um, very immature, a lot of volatility. And what actually happens, the, the big difference here is, look, Bitcoin is the new digital gold. So I don't have any, I'm not really too concerned about, um, are we going to make it? Oh yeah, I believe we're going to make it. But have a look at gold. The thing is with gold, we don't know how much gold is really out there. We don't know how much of it is real uh, in the vaults or whatever the case. You cannot audit it. BTC is perfect. It is you can. It is perfectly audited. So we have the um, the asset, the auditable asset. We can see it on chain. It's always going to be there. And then we can go ahead and trade it derivatives. So uh, a lot of people believe and speculate that, that the gold market is bullshit. You cannot bullshit the Bitcoin market. So you know when all these big players are coming in and they're going to be trading BTC, they need to hold spot. They need to they need to hedge. So uh, look, early days, mate. Very early days. So, so what are your bull run targets here? Are we going to get a pump in the halving? Is the halving a big nothing burger again? Is this a, is this an event that's been over anticipated, right? Where now everybody's, we owe all the other, all the other events have dropped. And so now it's, everyone is just focused on one thing. And if there's one thing I've ever learned in crypto, it's that the obvious never is what happens. Exactly. Uh, what what do you feel like would happen at the having? I I think it could it could even potentially dump just to psych people out, you know. And then, uh, you know, long term though, obviously the having has has huge implications on the whole market, right? Yeah. So I mean, right now it's look you could see the the, the pump up to like the eleven twelve k zone as you know sort of a a lot of people fomoing in because that was that that's a having pump right there coming into. Um, the 12k region that was like you know it's 3,000 and people thinking hold on 3,000 Bitcoin's about to have block roads fuck no you know it's just it, it is it's way too cheap 3,000 now uh, now we're sitting around 7,000 7,000 it feels like a 
a reasonable price for BTC. I mean, 7,000 a coin, block halving. I just sort of feel like it's, it's reasonable. You know, it's not too low. It's not too high. It's just in a good spot. And, you know, look at the strength of the US dollar. Uh, people sort of underestimate how much a, a dollar really is. It's, it's, it's very strong, very strong. So I feel like coming into the halving, look, the day of the halving, is there going to be anything? No, uh, there could just be like a, a bit of volatility because it's a, it, it's a news event. But um, these events are generally well priced in before the actual date. So uh, look, uh, just continue looking at the chart, looking at the, you know, the fundamentals, the long view. Look, if we go low, if we go really low, like, you know, the three, four K regions, you'll find a way to get cash into BTC. And then from there, look, it either keeps going down and it goes to fucking zero or it, it goes most, much lower than we could imagine. But it gets to a point where it goes so low that we've, it, it can't go any lower because we can just buy it all up. And I mean, there's only a certain amount of BTC. And then once all the sellers are exhausted and, and once we get to that, past that capitalization point, there is only one way from there. It just depends. Where is the bottom? Was 3,000 the bottom? Uh, are we just sort of basing before that next move? I don't know. All I know is that, hey, I truly believe this shit is going to be worth a hell of a lot more in 10 years than it is today. Uh, and hey, if it goes lower, I'll buy some more. I'll figure out how to get cash. I'll break into cars. Oh, you know, I'll go ahead and hold up a bank. I'll figure something. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's it's been certainly a very entertaining conversation. You're a very entertaining guy. Uh, if you guys aren't following Bitlord, definitely go follow him on Twitter. I'll link his Twitter in the description of this video. What are your closing thoughts here? What 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 do you want to leave the audience with? You know, what's your message here? Look, guys, think long term. You know, think long term. Uh, if you if you're not already in BTC. Obviously, um, you know, maybe buy a little bit just to just to test it out. So you've got some, you can be a part of the journey, get involved in the space, um, you know, have some fun, enjoy yourself, find your passions and pursue them. That's what it's all about. Um, don't get too distracted in, in regards to the price. But um, as we like to say, you know, to the moon, that's that's what it's about. Let's have some fun. So. That's all from me. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know I certainly did. If you enjoyed it, hit that like button. If you're not already subscribed to FUD TV, hit that sub button and be sure to hit that bell notification. YouTube just changed their algorithm. So if you don't have the bell on, you're probably not gonna see these videos. So hit that bell and join FUD Nation. As usual, I'm Elio Trades. You're watching FUD TV and I'll see you very soon on the next episode.